What's going on everybody? Welcome to After Prison Show and today I want to share with you guys a question that was raised by somebody who watches After Prison Show, a supporter of this channel. It wasn't a comment that was left on YouTube, it was actually a message I received on Instagram and it got me to thinking and I want to share this with you guys. This comes from a person by the name of the Fran Graham on Instagram who says, Hi Joe, I'm a fan of your show. I've been following you since the start. I had a question for you. So you talk about how when you got arrested on the drug charge that sent you to prison for seven years, your father pretty much slammed the phone on you. When you got out, he clearly didn't trust you. How did you rebuild your relationship with him? Man, that's a... That's a powerful question right there. He would also ask another question. Well, he asked three questions. I'm going to answer two of the three in this video. But I think that that's a really important thing to talk about because there's so many people who burn bridges from either getting in trouble, getting locked up, or because of addiction or a combination of all of the above. You know, when you're when you're effing up in your own personal life, your family, your friends, your loved ones, whoever, your dog, your cat, they are all going to turn their back on you. When you ain't causing yourself no good out in the world and you got people who are bending over backwards trying to help you, if you're even so lucky as to have that, there's a lot of people who don't have that at all. I truly feel like most people can only take so much before they're going to just cut it off. Just cut off the support, the money train if there's that, and most importantly, like just the contact, communication, and everything. They gotta like just, they gotta let go. And you can't fault them, you can't be mad at them because they do this, you're going to be, you're gonna blame them. Oh, my family turned their back on me, man, just sharing this with you, I'm reminded that I was thinking that exact same thing during that time. Yo, how could my family just turn their back on me? We supposed to be family. Family doesn't leave family messed up, no matter how messed up that particular family member is. It would take a long time for me to actually begin to understand that what they did was the right thing to do. And I couldn't blame nobody for that but myself. But how do you turn that around? How do you do better? How do you prove to your loved ones that, you know, you're going to do better? You are better. That you don't want to make those same mistakes again. You know how many times I told my family that? I'm done. I'm better. I've changed my ways. I found God. Like, whatever the case may be. And it ain't but a short time later when I'm back knee deep in all of the bullshit. If you're anybody like me who has made constant mistakes and you want to know, like, how do you repair bridges? Is it even worth it to try? The simple answer is, well, if it's family, of course it's worth it to try. And how do you do that? There's no way that you can just go to your family and say, hey, look, I'm different. I'm better. Especially if they've cut you off and you're out there on your own. The only thing that you can do is just do it. Make the changes that you got to make for yourself. And hopefully, your family will see. You got to walk the walk. Not just talk the talk. That sounds so stupid to say, but it's the truth. You have to prove to people. You have to regain their trust, and the biggest way that you do that is just to prove it, to do it. Go out there and find work, a steady employment, good employment. Work your way up to good employment. If you can't find that initially, start in a halfway house or a homeless shelter or wherever you've got to start at, then rent a room, and then try to get you, you know, some kind of a rental. There's a million ways that you can rent right now. You know, there's people who are doing owner financing for these flip houses that look like death traps, but not all of them are that. You know, if you got horrible credit, yo, they gonna rent to you. There's flippers out there right now that are flipping houses. They're gonna rent to you because they trying to beat capital gains tax and they need to hold property for two years or more. Like, there's people out there who will rent to you. I, I'm going so deep on this particular topic because I just recently became part of a Facebook page. It's called uh, Hampton Roads, like, rental properties or something like that. And I thought that this was going to be about flipping and property investment. And truth be told, all this is about is people posting, bitching about the fact that they can't find nowhere to rent and they're looking for a private owner. You know, you keep bitching about the fact that you got a couple of judgments on your credit and you missed, you know, a couple of payments at a couple of places. Ain't no private owner going to rent to you. But that's off topic. In my personal story, you know, when it came to my family, my mother... She washed her hands of me for 10 years. And I couldn't even be mad at her. You know, I was doing drugs. I had a drug problem. This is my early 20s I'm talking about. And up till the point that I ended up getting locked up to do the seven years. My drug problem might have not been as severe, but I was still doing drugs. 
maybe more so recreationally, but whatever the case, I mean, I'm still sniffing powder, trying to be out there selling it, thinking I'm some freaking Tony Montana. I ain't nothing. I'm a nobody. That's what I was. My mother washed her hands for over 10 years. She would come back around toward the end of my incarceration. She felt bad. She apologized. Joey, I'm sorry. Mom, you don't got to apologize for nothing. It is me. I'm the piece of shit. We would begin to rebuild our relationship. My father, on the other hand, you know, this man had tried and tried and tried. And I know so many other families. I see it now. It's kind of crazy with the shoe being on the other foot. Now I'm a better person. And I see other families. I get messages from other families. I deal with it on a very personal level as well. And, you know, I see these families that bend over backwards for people who just ain't worth a f out there getting high, just doing whatever they're going to do, manipulating, taking advantage of, conning, bullshitting, just to keep the party going for themselves. If that's what you want to do, that's what you're going to do. Can't nobody tell you, you know, different. Oh, Joe, you shouldn't call people a piece of shit if they're dealing with an addiction problem. You're going to be that. I don't care how that sounds. I ain't got. Like, my cut card is done. I, I, there's no, there's no, there's no dilution to this Kool-Aid whatsoever. This shit is straight Kool-Aid and sugar and water. That's it. I ain't cutting nothing. If you out there and you effing up, you're not just effing up your own life. You're effing up the lives of people around you who care about you. You're risking so much in regards to that. And at some point, they got to cut, they, they got to cut their losses. And I know people who don't do that, who still continue to get dragged along for the ride and it's, it's, it's messed up. Still will bend over backwards, thousands upon thousands of dollars in rehab programs and things like that when, <sighs> I'm going so far on a tangent right now and I do, a, I, I'm sorry. <clears throat> My father was a totally different story. Man tried, to, you know, he bent over backwards for me. When I came home from prison the first time, he let me come live with him. I'll never forget. I was only doing 18 months on my first prison sentence. It was my third violation. I got all of my time back on my violation. That was 18 months, all the time that I had left that they could sentence me to. They gave it all to me. I sat in the jail for 11 months. I went to prison for six months, something along them lines. And right before I was getting ready to get released, my father came to visit me. And I guess he just wanted to do like an assessment to see where I was at. Oh yeah, dad, you know, I changed my ways. I'm ready to do it different out here. Man, I came home. I went to probation. I'm trying to find a job. My dad's taking me to all these different places trying to help me find work. I found work within three days. I was working at a marina. But I went to probation and probation told me, you're done. You don't got nothing to do because I was under the impression that I had six months of mandatory parole time to do. That was a farcity. I didn't have none of that. So I'm out there on my own, no leash at all. And it ain't long before I am right back into the bullshit. Going out to the bars, finding the plugs, getting in with the fire, pow, pow. And it was downhill from there, working a job, making $10 an hour. I got laid off because of the recession in 2008. I'm the lowest paid employee. I'm feeling bitter. Oh, they want to fire me. That's messed up. I worked there for 10 months. I gave them my all, which I did. And I came to work high all the time on e-pills. Crazy, crazy time of my life. I was doing a lot of that back then. And... You know, I still tried, you know, to not go so far back overboard. Even went and talked to an army recruiter, told him, hey, send me to Iraq. I don't care. They told me I got to get some college classes and a GED. F that, I'm back in the streets. I tried to get a job at Hardee's. I'd only worked one fast food job prior in my life. I lasted there for two days. Hardee's would not even hire me. Give me the pack. My father kicked me out six months after I had come home from prison. And within 10 months of being released, I was locked up again and would end up getting sentenced to the seven years in prison that I served. I will never forget the night that I got arrested, told on myself, tried to spare everybody else, get to the jail eventually, and I get that chance to make that first phone call and I call my father. And I will never forget that phone call. That's what this person, Fran, had mentioned. You know, when I called my father and he, he banged on me, I called my dad from jail. He got that collect call. You've got a collect call from, hey, it's Joe or Jay, whatever I was calling myself back then. My dad answered just to hear what I was getting ready to say. Hey, dad, I messed up in a big way. I'm facing a lot of time. I need a lawyer. My dad said, yeah, I heard. Your brother, uh, your brother told us. I don't remember how my brother knew, but he knew. And um, he said, you're going to be gone for a long time. Good luck to you. 
And he hung up the phone. I can't even imagine. You know, I was so upset. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm alone. Woe is me was the feeling that I was dealing with right then and there. Such a selfish way of thinking and feeling, but that's what it's going to be when you're in that situation. You ain't going to be thinking about nobody else but yourself. I'm surprised I didn't tell. Let's just be real about it. But I didn't because I thought I was so gangster. You know, I think about how that affected me personally, but I never took into consideration what my father had to be thinking at that moment when I called and told him all that bullshit. I went through my seven years and eventually my father would begin to speak to me again. Man, he's such a good man. A couple of years later, my father would begin speaking to me again. And when I got released from prison, he was there. Not there to pick me up or anything like that, but he was there for me like supportively. Even gave me a little bit of money to try to help me out when I got released. And I had made a vow during the seven years that I served, long before me and my father even got back into communication, but I made a vow to myself, another selfish thinking, but this is how I had to do it. I said, you know what, forget everybody else. They should have never gave up on me. We're family, you don't do that to family. You know what, if I end myself right here, if I game over right here, ain't nobody gonna care. They're gonna think it's for the best. F that, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna do it so good. I'm gonna do it to the max. I'm gonna be so successful. I'm in prison playing house, putting my little scrapbook together or the shoes I'm gonna get and the car I'm gonna drive. Hope, I've mentioned it, you gotta have it. Don't matter if it's dumb or not and you're playing with paper dolls in prison, your ass needs something to be looking at, to be hopeful of, that what you're gonna go home, some tangible shit that you're gonna go home and try to work toward. And I don't mean going home and getting you a kilo to try to get it that way neither. I came to a decision very early into my incarceration that I was gonna do it totally different, totally different. I was gonna prove to the world that look at me now, like look at how good I can be, how successful, I'm smart. I'm not as dumb as y'all think that I am and I'll be damned if I didn't stick to that lucked up with the YouTube thing and have tried to like do the most that I can because of that, in spite of that, with that, every day. Never take a moment for granted. Make the most of every day. Like I freaking got those words tattooed on my side. What I say at the end of every video, if you got people who have turned their back, be selfish. Prove it to yourself first and then they're gonna see it. And they're gonna be proud of you. And you know how motivational that's gonna be? To have people be proud of you for once in your life? When was the last time you had that? That'll, that'll fill you with some hope. Oh, they're proud of me now? Shit. Well, watch how much more proud I can make them. You know, before I move on to this next question that this guy had asked, I want to throw this in here as well. In conclusion to all of that, at this point in my life, home from prison now for going on six years this year in October, it'll be that. You know, me and my father, we got a great relationship and he's super proud of me. You know, he gets excited hearing about all the crazy shit that I'm doing, the houses, the bitcoins, the, just the wild shit. And I'm so happy that I've been able to rebuild this relationship and regain his trust. Regain his trust. That's another thing. Not only the trust of my father, but my brother as well. And I want to share one thing real quick that really signifies like that trust that my family has for me now. And it's a messed up situation, but it's worth noting. A couple of years ago, my brother's home would get broken into. Uh, my brother had a bunch of guns, legal guns, but these people broke into his home and stole his guns. And, you know, he reported this to the police. I don't know that they ever really recovered any of the weapons. I'm not honestly sure or not. But, you know, my brother would call me to tell me about that. And one of the first things that I would say after hearing that and hearing how crazy that is, damn, that's crazy, man. Sorry to hear that. Hey, you don't think that that was me, do you? And my brother was like, that never even crossed my mind. As messed up as that whole situation was right there, you know, that was a good thing to know that I had changed so much and in such a way that people don't even think about me in a criminal type of a way anymore. I'm very proud of not only how far I've come in my life, but also for rebuilding and reestablishing the relationships that mean the most to me, the relationship of those of my family, with my family. And if I can do it, you can do it, anybody can do it, you just got to do it. Embrace the suck, like this motivational speaker I like, David Gobbins, I think is his name. I could be pronouncing that incorrectly, but that dude is a monster. If this don't motivate you, go watch one of his videos. That dude will have you out there ready to eat you some hydroxy cut and go do 4,000 push-ups. I mean, for real, he's... He's a beast. Fran the Graham would ask, he has three questions altogether. Another one about the scared straight programs. Ah. But he asked this as well. I'm sorry, I have one more question. I'm not sure if you have heard of the police impersonator, Jeremy DeWitt, but how would he be treated in prison? I don't know 
uh, about this dude, Jeremy DeWitt, that you mentioned right here, but you do mention police impersonator and how they're treated in prison. Hey, that reminds me of this one time at band camp. One of the cellmates that I would end up with, who I think was a plant, I think he was put in my cell for a reason. This was back in the jail prior to me getting my time, so my case is still wide open. Anything can happen. They put this federal inmate in my cell, this big, fat, white dude. Not, not that fat, but fat. You know, SO looking type of a dude, never been locked up before. This dude gets moved into my cell kind of almost in the middle of the night. That's a major red flag right there. And like, I don't trust this dude off rip because of that. And then he tells me he's a federal prisoner. Don't trust him because of that. There, Because all of the federal prisoners I'm seeing at the time in this jail, they are snitching. I'm not saying that all federal prisoners do that. I would end up asking this dude pretty much immediately, yo, what are you in here for? And this dude would tell me, oh, not only impersonating a cop, I think this dude was impersonating a Homeland Defense personnel, something crazy he got charged with, where like he pulled up on the scene of an accident and tried to start assisting people. And when the police arrived, they asked him who he was. And he told him he was like with DOD. And somehow he ended up with a federal charge because of that. Now, he, that's the story that he told me. I don't know how much of that is actually true. I do know he was a federal prisoner. That sounds like a federal charge. But this dude was definitely going to see his lawyer quite a bit. He was bitching to me about some people that were staying in his house because he was locked up. They were basically taking advantage of the situation, not paying him. And this dude tried to contract me, kind of, to like do a hit. I'll never forget he comes back from his lawyer visit. And again, when you're going to see your lawyer multiple times, or at least that's what you're saying, another red flag. This dude comes back one time, I'm working out. And he says, hey, Joe, I need you to get me something. I'm laughing because I already know this shit's about to be like a, a Dateline reenactment right here. Yo, what you need me to get you? I need you to get me a... Oh, you talking about a super soaker squirt gun? Shit, you can order that on Amazon Prime. I didn't, Amazon wasn't even a thing during that time. At least it wasn't as big as it is now. Yo, from that moment, I told everybody, yo, don't F with my cellmate. This dude is bad news. He ended up getting his ass kicked. I can't remember the details of that. I had already gotten moved out of the cell by that point. I'm pretty sure I asked the guards to move me. I didn't feel good being in the cell with this dude. I can't remember how I ended up leaving there, but I would end up leaving and... You know, that's the closest that I can tell you of a personal experience being locked up with somebody impersonating law enforcement. Now, you know, add to that that this dude was a snitch. Hands down, he was definitely that. Was willing to do whatever it took to get out of the bad situation he was in. And he got his ass kicked. I think if I can remember correctly, he was running his mouth. Somebody whooped his ass. Good for them. But when I think about like how would a person who was impersonating a cop be treated in prison? Now, I don't know anything about this guy that you're asking me about. It only felt right that I looked this guy up. Florida man notorious for impersonating cops arrested again. He was taken into custody during a traffic stop after an Orange County Sheriff's deputy noticed motorcyclists dressed as law enforcement. Oh, this dude was trying to be a, a motorcycle cop. Uh, this guy has a criminal history of impersonating law enforcement. Okay. So where I was going to go, I don't need to read no more than that. How's that dude going to be treated in prison? He's going to be a celebrity. Damn, dog, you back again. You dumb as a bitch. Hey, did you pull anybody over out there? You did? <laughs> they dumb as shit too. Unless he was doing something crazy like pulling over women and you can see where that could go. Shit ain't going to be looked at in my opinion, my personal opinion, like all that big of a deal. People are going to think he's a clown more than anything, but maybe he's a cool dude. Maybe he just messed up for real. Maybe he wanted to be a cop his whole life, but couldn't get out of the robber aspect. So he said, you're police academy. I'm going to go out there on Amazon, order me a police uniform and do that shit myself. To answer your question, Fran, how is he going to be treated in prison? Probably just fine. There's a thousand people in there for crazy shit. Everybody's got a crazy story. And uh, he's just another one of the lot. Again, my personal opinion. I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did so, please leave a like and a comment letting me know exactly what you thought about this. And as always, until next time, enjoy life, the free world. Never take a moment for granted and make the most of every day. Peace.